There we go. Okay. Okay, so we're going to get started, everyone. So we're continuing. We started learning Maseches Tamid, and we're in the Mishnah. If you're using the art scroll that's going around, you'll see that in the art scroll, you got two options. In the front is where you have the Hebrew Aramaic, and in the back, you got the classic art scroll. So if you're in the front, it's Chavhei Amid Beis, and we're in the uh, part of the Mishnah at the end of the line, the last line on Chavhei Amid Beis. If you're using the back, it's uh, 25B2, the last lines. So we said in the Mishnah last night, we were talking about the sleeping arrangement for the Kohanim. The sleeping arrangement, they were in the map of the Beis HaMikdash, they were in that section number 20, the box 20 that was on the right side, that's on Safan, on the north wall. That was called the Beis HaMokad. That was the chamber of the fire. It was called that way because they always had a bonfire burning in there to keep the Kohanim warm because it could get quite cold in the Beis HaMikdash with no shoes and socks and it's a stone place. So now we're talking about how they slept. So now the Mishnah is going to get into a very practical concern. It says, Era keri la echad man. Let's say one of them had a seminal emission during the night or while they were uh, um, sleeping in there uh, in the evening, whatever it was. So they've got at the time of the base of Mikdash, someone would have to go to the mikvah. And after going to the mikvah, they're still called a tful yom until, until the sun sets the following night. So what would they do? So again, it's the Beis HaMikdash, it's the night. The gates have been locked. They're stuck in the Beis HaMikdash, but at the same token, we want to begin the purification process. So what happens? So Eira Keri Lachamab, one of those Kohanim who's sleeping in the chamber in the Beis HaMokad at night, let's say one of them has a seminal mission. So the Lach is Yotze So he exits the, he exits that fire hall. What does he do? So we're turning, if you're in the back, we're on 26A. Again, if you're in the front, we're now on Chav Vav Amid Aleph on top. So it says, There was a special tunnel that went beneath the Beis HaMikdash to a subterranean mikvah. There must have been a spring that was running underneath the, the Harabayas that they had uh, made into a mikvah, a subterranean mikvah beneath the Beis HaMikdash. So we'll see this uh, later, I believe it's in, it's in uh, Meseches Tamid. If not, it's definitely in Midos. If you look at that map of the Beis HaMokad, that was uh, room number 20, that big chamber where the Kohanim were, you'll see in the corners, there were four uh, special rooms in the corners. In the northwest corner, I believe that's where the staircase was that they would take, to, it was like a spiral staircase that would go down uh, to that tunnel that would take them to, this, to that subterranean mikvah. So it says, there was a, a, a tunnel that traversed, that went along in, inside the, uh, underneath the base of Mikdash. And they always made sure that there were either torches or that were on the walls, on either side uh, of the walls, just to make certain that there would be, that there would be light because there could be all sorts of twists and turns in that tunnel. So to make sure that there would be plenty of light there was either torches or there was lamps that were always born, uh, always burning on the on the walls of there. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped the line. Veneros dokum economy kan ad shumagiel abesatzvila, and those lights would have a well lit path in that subterranean tunnel because obviously you know sunlight's coming down there until he could get to the besatzvila, until he could get to that mikvah that was beneath the ground. Medura haisasham. And by that mikvah, there was another big bonfire. What was the purpose of that bonfire? The purpose of that bonfire was that after having gone to the mikvah, you could imagine it was quite cold. It was a, it was a natural spring coming from the earth and therefore the water was probably chilled as well as the fact when they got out of that all times of the year, they would need to dry off, they would need to warm up. So there was a bonfire that was constantly kept lit down there as well. Anyone who's ever been in Sfat, the uh, famous Arizal mikvah, you know just how cold a spring-fed mikvah can be. So, so <laughs> that's that. Now, fascinating, the Mishnah continues, says, Ubeis HaKise Shal Kavod. Not only was there a bonfire there, there was a Beis HaKise Shal Kavod. There was a very dignified bathroom, restroom over there. What made this bathroom so dignified? So if you look at the, um, the uh, again, it's not the Rashi. We said it was called the Mefaresh. So in the in the front would be a chavava meralef on the right side. Basically, covered. What does it say? Zel kvodo. What made it such an honorific uh, a restroom? Lefishiyeshbo pesach. There was a doorway. Vadim shenich neshama. If a person went in there, yimtzu no. 
let's say someone wanted to go use it, <coughs> he would see that the door is locked. So Gur, he'd say, okay, someone must be in there, so I'll, I'm not going to bother him because I know someone's in there. In other words, it seems like rather than having to, well, there's two ways I saw to understand this. Either A, there was a doorway just in general, so there was some privacy, and someone saw the door was shut, then they, they knew the person needed their privacy until they're done, and then I'll go in. Otherwise, what it meant was that even, the, let's say all bathrooms or restrooms had a doorway, but this one had a special mechanism, like, you know, on the airplane, that you turn the thing, and then on the outside, it says occupied or, or vacant, something like that. It was some kind of way to, to tell that someone was in there. So you never had to exchange words. You never even had to say, uh, is it busy? Is it used? And someone had to say, I'll be out in a minute. That You never even had to say that. There was some kind of mechanism there in the door that could make it very clear what the story was. I, I think back when I saw this mission originally, I think back to when I was a kid, we had a, uh, we had a firm Boy Scout troop in Cleveland. A couple of the shoals had banded together and we had a Boy Scout troop. And I remember one summer, I don't remember if it was going into seventh grade, eighth grade, nothing, whatever it was around that time period. So we went off to scout camp for a week in the summer. And it was a great experience where you spent that whole week earning your merit badges. So all the stuff you couldn't do throughout the year, like, uh, you know, fishing, canoeing, life-saving, shotgun shooting, rifle, all that kind of archery, all that kind of stuff you couldn't do back home. We had, it was a wonderful time we had there. So I, I think at some point, this Boy Scout camp, when it was built, it must have been designed with people who have been coming from the military. And I remember just being blown away. One of the bathroom uh, uh, houses there, the latrine houses there, I'd never seen something like this. It was set up and there was no privacy whatsoever. It was just, let's say, six toilets on one wall facing six toilets on the other wall. So everyone just sat there doing your business and, and, and looking across. I remember being horrified by this. And we found out that a short, like five, 10 minute walk away, there was some kind of regular you know, bathroom that you know, was an outhouse, whatever, but it had doors or something. We, we all gladly took the trek to, to go out there. I just remember being, and someone telling me that this was a standard military thing. Is that, is that true of a climate that this, and maybe at a certain point in time, this would have been. Uh, But now, now that's not the way you'd find this on like a training camper, right? They're giving people their privacy. Yeah. Okay, so that's been outdated. So good. That's something that so that it just was bizarre. I remember seeing that and just being horrified. But here it is. You see the time in a Mishnah calling a basakisa shall cover. People deserve their privacy, and everyone deserves their privacy when they're taking care of their business there. All right. So so there there was something. By the way, and this one had halachic ramifications. Some of them are and bring down that if someone was going to the mikvah because of that seminal emission, it was essential that they had gone to the bathroom first, clean out their bowels, clean out their urinary tract, everything before they would go into the mikvah uh, to make certain to, as part of the tara process. So it wasn't just a convenience, it could have had a lack of significance too to have gone to the restroom at that point. All right, so let's see further. So the Mishnah continues and it says, Zahayakvodo, what made this restroom so dignified? Matzanol, if you found the door closed or if it was locked, you knew someone's in there. Pasuach, if it was open, if it was unlocked, you do a shein shamadam. So it's like what that Mafari said up front, but just not spelled out. The Mafari spelled it out a little bit more. So it was a way that it provided extra dignity, uh, whether or not it was uh, you know, it was occupied. All right, Mishnah continues and it says, Yarad Vitaval. So this guy would now go down into that subterranean mikvah, immerse himself. All of an istapog, he would come up, he would dry himself off. Then he's chamim can I get a madura? We said there was a fire or a fireplace that was always lit there, so the person could warm themselves up in front of that large fire. And then he would come back up, go back up that staircase into the base of Mokad, and he would spend the night there with his fellow Kohanim, I'd show you Sharam Niftachim until the morning when they would unlock the gates and open them. And at that point, Yod Seva Allahlo, at that point he would leave. Why would he have to leave? Because we said that he's a tful yom. He's someone who's gone to the mikvah. And uh, until the sun sets the, that, the next night, he's, he's not 100% tahar. Therefore, it wouldn't be appropriate for him to be in the base of mikdash. So why didn't we throw him out during the night? So uh, the Mefarish brings down, and others say this as well, this idea of a tful yom not being allowed in the base of mikdash was a drabanan. It's on the rabbinic level. And therefore, the rabbinic said, under such conditions, it's the middle of the night. We're not going to start giving this person. The, it's, 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 not, it's not pleasant to have to leave. We're so used to having outside lighting and electricity and whatnot. In the days of yore, when the sun went down, it was very unpleasant to go outdoors and to, to leave. So therefore, they, they had Rahmanas on him that he shouldn't have to leave until the morning. This for him. Yes. Oh, 
when in the Beis Hamokar, he was outside, right? He's in the section. Correct, but he's still at Harabas. I think there, that's a Durabanan. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, 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 correct. Uh, you're 100% right. In that base Hamoka, there was a line of demarcation. And that, that was a point Alicia brought this up the other night. And we're going to see that's going to have, uh, I think that's going to have significance coming up soon as well when we get to, to, to one of the points that's going to be discussed. So you're, you're 100% right, Rizan. Thank you. All right, so let's see. We'll see a little more of the Mishnah. The Mishnah continues and it says, okay, now that we've gotten through talking about the sleeping arrangements and what would happen if someone was a Balkari. So now we talk about, and this is what time it's going to get into, what was the order of the day? Step by step, what was the order of business in the Beis HaMikdash? So the first step, the first point of operations every morning was the Truma Sadeshen. So the Truma Sadeshen was a special avoda that a Kohen was selected to go up onto the Mizbeach in the Chatzar and to go into, into that, onto the top of the Mizbeach and take off some of the ashes from the previous day's avoda, bring it down the ramp and just to the east of the ramp to put it onto the ground. And that's what that was that avoda called Truma Sadeshen. Uh, elsewhere, we're going to see that a miracle occurred every day in the Beis HaMikdash, and this would occur that those ashes that were put on the ground on a, on a stone, mar marble surface, would be absorbed into the ground. It was one of the nisim that occurred in the in the Beis HaMikdash. So the first avod of the day was the Truma Sedashen. So the Mishnah now says, Mishu Shehu Rotsa Litra any Kohen who is sleeping that night in the Beis HaMokad, anyone who wants to have dibs, at having the zuchus, having the great merit of being the one to perform truma sedashin in the morning, Mashkin Vitova would get up early and go to that subterranean mikvah. Because again, anyone who was going to do the avoda, uh, you couldn't have the possibility of doing the avoda unless they were 100% tar. So, any, so it wasn't just the Balkari, that the fellow with the seminal mission who had to go, but anyone who wanted to have a hand in that first piece of action, that truma sedashin, they would also go to the mikvah, Adsha lo yavo hamamuna. Before the Mamuna, Mamuna means the appointed one. That was going to be the Kohen whose job it was to divvy up the tasks for the day. So before the, the one who was in charge of that would arrive, they would already have to be tar. Uh, so now it says, shab Mamuna. The Mishnah asks, by the way, at what point did that Mamuna, at what point did he show up? Local item Shavos, there wasn't one exact set time. It wasn't like they said, okay, he's always going to be there at five in the morning or something of that nature. Pamim Shuba Mikrosa Gever, there were times that he arrived when the rooster would cry. I think they said that's like a third, the last third of the night. That was the time when the rooster would start crying. A little before, a little bit after. So it wasn't an exact science when the Mamuna would show up. To start, uh, to start the process of, of uh, figuring out who's going to have the tasks and the first task being Shuma Sedeshen. Mishnah says, the Mamuna above the Kalayan, the Mamuna would show up and he would knock on the door. So again, going back to that map, they're sleeping in the Beis Amoka, that was uh, uh, room number 20. And you see 46, that's the shower, that's the door going to the Beis Amoka. So the gates are all locked. So the Mamuna would come, he's coming from the outside, he'd be knocking, according to most counters, he'd be knocking on that door to wake up everyone in the Beis HaMokad. Again, there was people up already because they wanted to be in on the option of having the Truma Sedeshen. They would open the door for him, Amrlan, he would say to them, Misha Taval, whoever's already gone to the mikvah, Yavo V'yafis, they should come and participate in the lottery. Efisu, they made the lottery. And then it says, Zacha Misha Zacha, whoever won that lottery, they've got the Zuchus, they've got the merit of doing the uh, Truma Sadeshen, the first avoda of the day. Just to briefly uh, discuss, what did the lottery consist of? It wasn't that, you know, they picked out straws or they put in their names in a, in a bucket or something like that. The Mefarish says it, and it's brought down elsewhere too. The way the lottery worked was he formed all the Kohanim who wanted to be in the lottery. And this would be true, not just of this lottery, but the rest of them as well. He, they would make a circle. And then he would start with, everyone would stick out a finger. Every coin would stick out a finger. The one who coin we started with would take off his hat take off his, his special hat that was part of the Bidde Kuna. And then he would, the Mamuna would pick a number far greater than theirs. So let's say there was 20 Kohanim in the circle. He would say 83, well, whatever, some number greater than the number of Kohanim. And he'd start with the Kohen who took off his hat and go either, uh, I don't know if he'd go in clockwise, I don't remember, but start counting the Kohanim's fingers. They all got to figure out one, two, three, four, until he gets to number 83, whatever number he chose. And that's the Kohen who won the lottery to to uh, to to go. So I saw some of the Mepharshim say, this took place. Where did this lottery take place in the Beis HaMokad, but not in the Beis HaMikdash itself for a couple reasons. Number one, they hadn't opened the doors, but also since it required taking off his hat for that, they, like so that wouldn't have been appropriate indoors. Therefore, like what Alicia and Rabbi Zayn were bringing up, it was done in the Beis HaMokad before that line of demarcation where they weren't in the Beis HaMikdash proper then. 
All right, we'll pause here and uh, God willing, we'll continue with the Gemara tomorrow night. We'll say a